Welcome to the Ransom Heart Podcast. Today in the studio is Alan Arnold and John Eldridge. And John, it's already the first week of December. Can you believe it? How did that happen? <laughs> like last week was March or April. And yeah. 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 I, don't I know. mean, it, it has been both a stunningly fast year, but an unbelievably full year as well. Oh. I mean, it's crazy. I was thinking back on it. We did the Restoration Conference. Right. We made right. a movie, for heaven's sake, right. and launched it. You right. Know, we, boot camps, captivatings. Right. You know. The loss of Craig. Yeah, the year with Craig. Um, and... Just so many highs, so many hard times, holy times. But it does feel good coming into the Advent season mm -hmm. and just slowing down, pausing a little. Yep. The rhythm of the outpost is... For those who don't know, it, it's really different this season. We've had a chance just to rest, restore, refresh. And John, you've been uh, out this morning doing some writing. So tell me a little bit more about what you're up to. Yeah. Yeah. thought we would riff a little bit on this today, friends. I am finishing a new book that I am stoked about. Mm. Um, the title of the book is All Things New. And the subtitle is, Heaven Actually Comes to Earth, Restoring Everything You Love. Obviously, the big idea, uh, something that we've talked about in, in places here and there. I've written a few blogs on it this year, but uh, when Jesus promises his return, he actually describes it as the renewal of all things, Matthew 19, 28. It's a, it's a theme that Peter repeats in Acts chapter 3, and then, of course, Revelation. Yes. You know, the whole book and the whole Bible reaches this sort of crescendo in Revelation chapters 21 and 22, the end of the biblical canon, and, and it says, Behold, I make everything new. God does not say, I make all new things. And, and kind of the mind-blowing idea is, when John sees the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven, it comes to the earth. God does not destroy the earth. He actually renews it, something that Paul talks about in Romans 8. So I am loving writing a book that is going to put technicolor, yes. HD, into people's imaginations of, wait, wait a second, what? Like, right, you, right. you get it all back, gang. Well, well and I want to just pause for a minute on what you just said, because it is mind-blowing. The church doesn't typically talk about, when you say heaven comes to earth, like what we've all grown up with for the most part is, well, when you die... Or when Jesus comes back, we get whisked up into heaven. Yes. And it's it's a little bit of a foggy, unclear next step after that. Like we, we don't quite know what happens. It's it's better than not going to heaven. Yeah. But you're saying something radically different. Yeah. Heaven is beautiful. Heaven is the dwelling place of God. Heaven is where your dear loved ones are now that you have lost and who have died in Christ. Heaven is where Craig is. And heaven is where my grandson, Patrick, is right now. But Peter says something mind-blowing in his famous Acts chapter 3 sermon. He's talking about Jesus Christ, who's been appointed the Messiah, and he says this, he must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Mm -hmm. So yes, yes, heaven heaven is the dwelling place of God, the angels. Uh, it's, it's the rest of the kingdom of God. It's the unseen part of the kingdom of God yes. right now. But the fascinating thing is, is even Jesus, he's saying, yeah, he's there until, mm -hmm. until his return, until the time for God to restore everything. And then heaven comes to earth. The kingdom of God comes to the earth. And the, the shout that goes up in Revelation 21 when the new Jerusalem lands on the earth is, uh, now the dwelling of God is with men. But, but again, even, even the language that's used here by Peter in Acts 3, he must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything. Mm. 
I, I just think that yeah. I know I, many Christians, uh, were kind of given the idea that what God does is he destroys everything. Right. And then we all go someplace else, uh, up above, right. you know. Right. Um, he doesn't destroy everything. He actually restores everything, which is a absolutely glorious and phenomenal concept. Well, and John, we were in a group meeting, a larger group meeting yesterday, just discussing this book internally with, with several on the team. And one of the things that you mentioned that, that really just, I could feel my heart just awakening to this hope was what we get to do in this new earth. Because again, when the most concepts of heaven, it's just has felt vague and yeah. wispy and yeah. unclear. Yeah. But talk a little bit about that. When, when the earth is made new, what will that look like? What will we do? Throughout, throughout Jesus' teaching, the parable of the minas, the parable of the talents, um, the sheep and the goats, and uh, when he announces the restoration of all things in, in Matthew 19, every time he does that, he's connecting it to um, some kind of promotion, some kind of endowing of honor and gifts, rewards, um, but also a place that is reserved for you, like your role in the kingdom of God. In the parable of the minas, you know, thank you for being faithful in a small thing. Yes. I'm putting you over 10 cities. And, and what's interesting in Matthew 19, 28, when he says at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me, anyone who has left houses, lands, family, work, will receive it all back a hundredfold. And here's the idea that um, Dallas Willard loved to use the phrase, we're in training for reigning. We're being shaped right now as men and women uh, uh, who have the character, who, who have the relationship with God, to the, to the point that when the day comes at the return of Christ, we are actually promoted. We're we're put into positions of influence, and, and here's, here's the wonderful news, in the very things we're good at. See, I love that in the minas. He, you know, he doesn't say, hey, wow, you handled that really well. Would you come over here and take care of this other thing for me? <laughs> right. He, he, right. He, he upgrades him <laughs> in the very thing that they were good at, right? The, right. And so let me, let me try and make it a little more concrete. You have gifts in you that the world gets to see a little bit of. And, and some very, very happy and fortunate people get to live a whole lot in their gifting. Most people get to live a little bit in their gifting. You know, their job just right. isn't quite the fit. You know, they wear a size nine and, and their job's a 10 and a half or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's just not a fit, you know? Mm -hmm. And so those latent gifts in you, your talents, your skills, your dreams, your those are all going to be, quote, employed. They're all going to be put into full action in the kingdom of God. That's huge. Now, now here's, a really, here's a really fun way to think about that. You, you have watched someone, I guarantee it, over the course of your life, you've watched someone who was really great at something. Maybe they were a musician and, and you saw them give a concert and you're like, man, that is just so impressive, right? Right. Or, or, you know, maybe the guy that's working on your house and, you know, is, puts in a deck for you, or he fixes something, and you, the way he is with tools, his hands, his, you know, or maybe it's your surgeon, right? Mm. You know, or, or someone who's very, very skilled at what they do. We've all watched that and gone, I would love to be able to do that. Yeah. Well, you will. The, that, that very desire in you is actually not in every person. Not everybody responds to those things in the same way. Right. I don't want to be a great musician, but some people do. I, I, I don't want to be a great scientist, but some people do, right? There are right. certain things I want to be great at, but those latent gifts in you, that potency in you, is the very thing that you're released into in the kingdom of God. Because again, friends, you get this world back. It's, God does not destroy the world and send us off to the heavenly choir. We actually join him, scripture says, we reign with him on 
the earth. And that includes, so some people's vision of that may be plains and fields and um, just land where they can explore. But what about for people who may be like the urban feel of the city? Yes, the restoration of all things at the epicenter of it is the New Jerusalem, right? It's a city. It's a staggeringly large city. It, it is 1,400 miles long on one side. Okay, well, so okay, four yeah. sided. You know, this is a very large. This is a very right. large place. Um, it's a Mediterranean city. It's not skyscrapers and smog and traffic jams and that kind of thing. Thank goodness. Uh, yeah. yeah, but the presence of the city of God allows us to think about the renewal of the arts, the sciences, education. Uh, industry, um, the trades, many of the Old Testament prophecies around the restoration of all things say things like, uh, you will plant vineyards, you will build houses and dwell in them. You know, it's, it, it, all of the faculties of human being are put back to work. Like, but it will be an absolute joy to us, right? Because yeah. we're completely healed from all our brokenness and we're living in absolute intimacy with God and, and his power is flowing through us. So, you know, we are his allies, but on a much grander scale with a much, frankly, higher set of capabilities and powers. Um, and we get the earth back. I mean, I just think that's mm -hmm. also an enormously, an enormously beautiful um, promise of that. And when you begin to think, wait a second, Paul says in Romans 8, all creation groans for the day of its redemption. Right. Okay, so creation has a day of redemption. And, and a day will come when we will walk the new earth as the new Adams and Eves, so to speak, with the new governors, the new regents, the sons and daughters of the living God on a remade earth. Like, think of it, like all your favorite places. You love, the, you love the ocean, you love the mountains, you love a garden, you, you love wheat fields, you love vineyards, you, you know, all those things. Can you imagine them on the day that they are reborn? Wow. I mean, they're gorgeous now. Right. There's a very touching story told about the English painter, Lilius Trotter, the first time that she saw the Alps, she just burst into tears at the sheer beauty of them. But can you imagine our reaction when we see them remade, re renewed? Well, and talk to me about what is the phrase in the book you use for Eden reborn, basically? It's the... Oh, the palingenesia? Yes. Yes, okay. Yes. So in Matthew 19, 28, when Jesus says at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, first off, I want to point out that he just tosses it out there. And, and you get the impression that he does not expect his listeners to be shocked by what he's just said. So he, these are Jewish disciples, many of them very well-versed in the scriptures, right. um, now followers of Christ. And in and, and the way he talks to them, you get the sense that he's just borrowing or banking on or a shared assumption. Oh, yeah, yeah, that day. When that happens, okay? Well, you go back and you look at all of the, the prophecies in Isaiah in particular, they are all towards the restoration of the heavens and the earth. It is the renewal of all things. The Jewish hope was not annihilation. It was not God destroys everything and we go somewhere else. They were hoping for the great restoration. And that's why he's able to just, Christ just kind of says it in one sentence and goes on. And you're like, wait, what? Time out. Wow. That is a mind-blowing thing. But the word that he uses there is the word that you were asking about. It's a Greek word in the New Testament, of course. The word is palingenesia. Uh, it's a conjunction of two words, paling, simply meaning again, and genesia, genesis, right? Genesis again, beginnings again. We're starting over. We are renewing things. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very powerful word. And the only other time it's used anywhere in the scriptures, um, Titus uses it when he speaks to our recreation. And, and he says, you know, humanity is reborn. Um, and, the, and Jesus says, oh yeah, just in the same way that God renews human beings, yes. you're not destroyed. You, you are Alan forever, right? 
You, you don't become Todd and you don't become Mary. You are Alan forever, but restored, renewed, fully in your glory. Well, he does that with creation as well. He does, it, frankly, with, quote, all things. It's the palingenesis. It's the genesis again. Which, at this time in our culture, at this time in the world, you were talking yesterday, John, about how everyone needs more hope. Oh, like there's this sense that we're untethered from and lack trust in almost every institution, right? Yeah, last week's Ohio State tragedy, you, you know, the, the, the wanton random evil um, that you see breaking out all over the earth Human beings are untethered. We, every institution that used to provide some kind of moral and psychological grounding, family, church, yes. community, that's all blown apart for so many people in the world. And we don't trust anything like the, you know, the survey data on people's confidence in, you know, their banks, their government, um, even their religious leaders, uh, denominational institutions, it's, it's at an all-time low. It's like yes. absurdly low. Um, so you have this, you have humanity, which is untethered and ungrounded, and, and then you have a world that's experiencing greater and greater levels of trauma. You know, you, you Syria, and uh, as one example of just the, the, just the unbelievable tragedy that people live with, two million children every year trafficked in, in the sex industry. Like that, that... This is just like a mind-boggling right. levels of trauma in the world. And in uh, the first chapter of the book, I simply talk about we need a stronger hope. The book of Hebrews calls it the anchor of the soul. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. And, and uh, that hope is the palingenesia. That hope is Revelation 21. It is all things made new. And and so I'm very, yeah, very excited about the timing of this book. It comes out next fall um, because people need hope and they need, they need more than just a silver lining outlook. Like, hey, you know, hang in there. It'll get better. Right. Like, right. Yeah. Which it doesn't seem to get better. It seems to be getting worse in terms of... Um, just the news each day, but also I, I think people feel like the earth is wearing out, patience is wearing mm -hmm. out, right. hope is thin. Right. And what you're saying, John, is, is so huge because we do get it all back. Like it's not, mm -hmm. and not just back, but in its original glory, in its yes. Eden form. Yeah. And we have that for eternity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So let me, uh, let me just read a little bit of what I was working on. The structure of the book in each chapter, I share a picture, a dream that I had about the kingdom of God. Um, and that process began about a year ago. Um, I would hear people talk about, yeah, I, I had this cool picture from God, or, or I had this vision uh, when we were in worship, or you know, something of that sort of phraseology. And, and uh, while I hear a lot from God, I, I don't see a lot from God, and mm -hmm. I realize the reason is I don't ask. <laughs> like I've never, <laughs> I've never asked for it, and I thought, gosh, wow. may, you know, maybe I'm not broken. Maybe I'm just not asking, you know. And so I began to ask simply out of the difficulty of the year. You know, folks know the hard year that we've been through, and I'm like, Jesus, I just need to see your kingdom, and and so I include some of those pictures at the beginning of each chapter um, that's relevant to what we're talking about. So chapter four begins with this. I dreamed of the kingdom again last night. This time I saw horses, 50 or 60 at least, galloping through fields of tall grasses. The grace and freedom of their thundering stride was captivating. Behind them rose mountains, majestic, rugged, snow-capped, it looked like the Patagonian steppe. But there was a freshness, a crispness to the scene, like the morning of creation. I thought perhaps they were wild horses, and then I saw riders among them. And then suddenly I too was among them, riding with them. We came to an embankment and stream crossing. Horse and rider mended their gait, 
and as soon as we were over, took off again like the wind. It was a glorious game of some sort, a romp. When I woke, I thought, surely I am making this up. I had breakfast and drove to work. There, on a city corner, where I have never seen such a sight in 20 years of living here, were riders on horseback. As if Jesus were saying, now do you believe me? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I do. And so chapter four is, um, what would it be like to have a new earth? And uh, it goes like this. We are preparing our hearts to receive the hope, which alone can be the anchor of our souls. One day soon, you will step into a renewed earth, a young earth, sparkling like an orchard of cherry trees after a rain shower. Joy will be yours. How do we open our hearts to this? After so much pain and disappointment, we have lost many things as we've passed through the battlefields of this war-torn world. Our humanity has been stripped of such essential goodness. One of our greatest losses is the gift of wonder, the doorway into the kingdom heart. So I go on to try and, and reawaken wonder. And let me, let me tell a couple stories from that. I said, Stacy and I honeymooned in Yosemite National Park. We had never been in that majestic valley before, and we arrived late into the night after a long drive, collapsing into bed with no idea whatsoever the cathedrals that rose all around us, the valley John Muir described as, quote, extremely rugged, with its main features on the grandest scale in height and depth, benevolent, solemn, fateful, pervaded with divine light. Every landscape glows like a countenance, hallowed in eternal repose, pulsing with the heartbeats of God. I woke in the morning, a little groggy, and stepped out on the back door to have a stretch. Thundering down thousands of feet before me roared Yosemite Falls. All I could do was yell, Stacy, Stacy, get out here. Now imagine, what are waterfalls like in the new earth? Think of your favorite places. What will it be like to see them in their glory? How sweet it will be to revisit treasured places again and see them as they truly are, unveiled, everything God meant for them to be. Part of what makes the wonder so precious is that while it is a new world, it is our world, the world most dear to our hearts. Fall is an especially magical time of year in the high country. I was walking in a grove of aspens yesterday evening, They are such beautiful, elegant trees. Long, white trunks, white as snow, grow upward 50 feet or more before the leaves crown the tops. I love the smoothness of the trunks, bending here and there as they reach upward. There's something about their form which reminds me of the beauty of a woman's body. At this time of year, the leaves are golden, And the late sunlight coming through the forest of aspens turns golden as it passes through the canopy. A soft breeze was blowing, and the yellow leaves were fluttering gently down all around me, falling softly like flower petals. It felt like some heavenly benediction. Tall evergreens, spruces, were scattered in the grove of aspens, and the golden leaves caught on their green boughs and made them look like they were decked out for some holiday like there was a grand party in the forest the night before. Here, among hundreds of living pillars of white, crowned with golden, I understand why the Celts believed in the sacred groves, just to place my hand on the smoothness of their trunk and feel its coolness and the life within, that is a healing act. The forest of white columns could have been a sanctuary from heaven or Lothlorien the elven kingdom of Middle-earth. And I just go on to tell stories about what will it look like, what will we see, what will we do in a renewed earth, including, and this is a really cool part, animals, gang. 
Uh, so here's the passage. The child heart wants to know, will there be animals in heaven? And the calloused grown-up heart dismisses the question as theologically unworthy. <laughs> May I point out that the whole debate ends when you realize that heaven comes to earth. Our home is right here on a renewed planet. How could our creative God renew his precious earth and not fill it with a renewed animal kingdom? That would be like a school without children, a village without people. The sheer barrenness and bleakness of the thought is utterly abhorrent to the child heart of God and his love for the animals, which are his precious creations. We know there are horses, for Jesus and his company return on horseback. I wonder what Jesus named his horse. Does he come to his whistle? Does he need a saddle? I bet he rides bareback, like the Indians did. I've seen those horses. I've seen the cavalry of heaven several times now. It happened as we brought the gospel on mission into a foreign territory. We'd be in a time of worship, and suddenly I saw the front line of mounted horsemen spreading out before me like the Rohirrim before Gondor, pennants waving, row upon row of horse and rider, lifted spears like a forest. Oh, yes, there are horses in the kingdom. And then this passage from Isaiah. The wolf will romp with the lamb, the leopard sleep with the kid, calf and lion will eat from the same trough, and a little child will lead them. Cow and bear will graze the same pasture. Their calves and cubs grow up together, and the lion eats straw like the ox. Now, okay, unless you want to dismiss this as completely allegorical, we have wolves, lambs, leopards, goats, cows, lions, and bears in the kingdom as well. It's beginning to sound like Narnia to me. So it's just fun, friends, to um, put in front of you some thoughts about the restoration of all things and what what is this hope that is strong enough to be the anchor of the soul? Well, it's, it's the palingenesia. It's Jesus speaking of the renewal of all things. Like, nothing is lost. Nothing is lost. John, I, I am so excited about this book. In the parts you've read and what you've talked to us internally about, like, it, I, it's just... One, it's jaw dropping in how we see right. the new heaven and the new earth, right. and so it's it's mythic, but it's also so specific and tangible and exactly. real. Right. And it, and then two, that awakens such a hope in us because, as you said, like everything we love, we get back. Yes, and everything that we've lost is back is restored to restored. us. Restored, yeah. and even our dreams that haven't come true mm -hmm. this side. Exactly. All your gifting, yes. all your talents, all of that is, is set loose in the new world, filled with the, with the Spirit of God. So for everyone that's listening and is going, I want to read that today. <laughs> yeah. Well, you probably heard John earlier say it's September of 2017 before the book comes out, but keep listening to the podcast because we're going to tell you early in the new year how you can pre-order the book, how you can read some sample chapters of the book. Yeah, and we'll do some shows on it too Absolutely. as well. Yeah. Hey friends, before we, before we go here on this first week of December, can I ask something of you? Um, we, we don't do fundraising at Ransomed Heart. We, we just aren't, that's just kind of not our vibe and it gets so overdone in this world. We just don't want to shout into that megaphone, but we are a nonprofit. And about half of our income is um, comes to us through the conferences we hold, the resources um, that we sell in our store, and about half our income comes through the kindness and generosity of folks like you. If you could here uh, in December make a gift to us, um, if that's something God puts on your heart, that, that would be wonderful. Because of Craig's graduation into the kingdom, uh, we had to cancel two conferences and and took a hit this year from that. And so if that's, um, if that's on your heart, if you'd love to help Ransom Heart carry on the mission that we do, you can get online on our website at ransomedheart.com and you'll see the tab that says give and you can give online there in a real simple way. Thank you. That would be huge for us. 
You've been listening to the Ransomed Heart podcast here in the first week of December with Alan Arnold and John Eldridge. And we'll be back next week with some more specific thoughts about the Christmas season. Stacy and I uh, will be in the studio talking about getting ready for the holidays and, you know, the good and the, and the ugly of all that and, and kind of how to prepare your heart and protect your heart as you move into the holiday season. So look forward to being with you next time.